Well, it's good to see all the shining faces back at UFM. This is a gorgeous campus, and it truly is my luck, if you will, certainly my pleasure to be here with you. And any of the presentations I give, there's a couple of simple rules. Be courteous of the speaker and the folks around you. And the second rule is, this is all about you, not me. If you have a question, either write it down on a piece of paper and pass it down, corner me afterwards, or put your hand up and ask. And like every college conference, I've noticed that the front rows are completely empty. Don't worry, I can go to the back row and ask questions just as easy as I can to the front row. All right, <clears throat> let's get down to some very simple housekeeping. Who here has never paid a bribe? Put your hand up. Two, three, four, five, six. That's a very tall hand. It's a very, I like that. Now, <clears throat> there's a question you should ask, and what's that question? It's a question you should ask of me at this moment. What is that question? Come on. Why wasn't my hand up? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's some times when you go into a country and they say, yeah, you can wait three and a half hours or you can pay $2 and get your visa now. Okay. <laughs> or being stopped in a car in Guadalajara, Mexico, my friend, in the passenger seat, Juan Antonio had just had his ex eyes examined, so he had those little, those little glasses on. He forgets all of his Spanish. Juan Antonio, ayúdame. <laughs> Juan Antonio, ayúdame. <laughs> Next thing, please come up. Sir, you were speeding. No, I wasn't. I know I still have to pay you, but I wasn't speeding. So we negotiated back and forth, and I got out for about $25 for zapatos prohibidos, illegal shoes. I commented them on their excellent x-ray vision. Then as we leave, I said, Juan Antonio, why didn't you help? He said, it's simple. If I vouched for a gringo, I'd have to pay for a fiesta for all of them. But tonight, it's just you and me. <laughs> what I'm sharing with you is that there's, there's a part of corruption that is absolutely part of human nature. None of us are saints. I gave a presentation about corruption in front of several FBI agents. I said, would any of you take a bribe for a million dollars? No. What about three million? No. What about 20 million? And the resident agent in charge for the state of New Jersey stood up. He's a big guy. He's got a gun and a badge too. He said, we would not take any money for any reason. I said, how about $50,000 so your son can have the operation to fix his leg that your insurance doesn't cover? He goes, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> and what that tells you, it's a true story, what that tells you is that the opportunity for corruption has a component of time and place. Time and place. <clears throat> I've studied fraud and corruption for 40 years. Uh, I've, I've been in as a financial investigator 30 years, and every day, every new case is a small university class on what's going on. So what would be to you an example of something that could be a fraud or have an element of corruption? You're looking at an investment. What might it be? Anyone? One of the scenarios I work in a due diligence class is you have an investment club. We meet on Monday, and every Monday I change the rules just a little. Are you going to invest? 100% say no. I said, why? Because we don't know what the rules are going to be next week, and the rules could be disadvantageous to us. Exactly. There's, there's the simple humanity. I mean, that's a great question, the simple humanity as part of time and place of corruption. How far back do you think I found examples of corruption in my reading? 50 years? Nah. Couple hundred? Yeah, there was corruption back then too. How far back do you think I could find it? 
The, the oldest written text I can find that deals specifically on the topic of corruption was the, excuse me, Artharashtha. It was a guy, they call him the Indian Machiavelli, that was written to give an emperor a part of the Indian, empire, Indian subcontinent a guide on how to manage his empire. And it had an entire section, chapter 8, on dealing with corruption and corrupt officials. When do you think that was written? I'll give you a hint. It was in Sanskrit. <laughs> Around 300 BC. And there are notes and annotations going back to the book to the very difficult corrupt judges in Egypt, six to 7,000 BC. Hey, corruption's nothing new. <laughs> so <clears throat> what do we see in a corrupt environment? You see a problem with promises. Some, the people are not their word, or yes, we can do that, but there's an addition. Overly complicated transactions. Why an overly complicated transaction? Because honestly, sometimes it takes a team to understand some of the contracts I've seen. And with something that's overly complicated, there's always an opportunity to put a little emolument, a little, a little reward for yourself and your team to the side. Another one is doing business in a socialist or communist country. Why is that? Why are they so subject to, to corruption? Come on. This is the Milton Friedman Hall. You should be screaming it out. <laughs> Why? Give me an economics reason. How about the young lady right here? See, I can see you. I'll ask you questions. <laughs> um. Is that because there is a lack of market and like people need markets to get what they need so they create black markets to still survive so they go against what the government is saying which is like you need to live under a socialist or a communist rule but it's because they need to get the things to survive. I should quit, you should come up here and teach. <laughs> that was exactly right. Because the economy doesn't work. The economy doesn't work. <clears throat> we were chatting over lunch about a Russian cartoon. <clears throat> uh, Alexander was going to go out on his own, and his father says, Mishka, how can you go out on your own? He said, it's very simple, Dad. Auntie has got me a job. Uncle, <clears throat> Uncle Sven, he has got me a car. And my girlfriend's mother works at the power company. She'll get my power turned on. And I've got someone who will get me some extra ration cards. I'm going out on my own. <laughs> and there's the joke. You can't go out on your own. There was a wonderful book called The Economy of Favors about the Russian system of economics. Everyone had a favor to trade. You had access to a person who had the power, access to the person who could turn on the phones. Every had some, everyone had something to trade incredibly powerful to see what has happened after the fall of the communist empire and it was an empire what do you see the same bad habits the same bad habits are still there it's an economy of favors but now the favors instead of of access to something is cash good i'll take 15 percent of that deal i'll take 11 percent of that deal I worked with many Russian businessmen, and they said, we have a problem. We have a problem, and that is we cannot be too successful. We didn't go to business school. As one fellow said, I went to military school. You obeyed orders. If you did not obey orders, you were demoted, drummed out of the army, thrown into prison, or shot. We didn't need any type of motivational courses. <laughs> and, and for us, it would, I, I would come with the cash, and I would, I would meet Sergei underneath uh, the bridge with the diamonds at midnight. I come with the cash, we meet under a bridge, he brings the diamonds at midnight. He said, the problem is, it becomes a complicated transaction when there's one, more than one bridge. 
Here you have some facts of looking at a country that has zero training in modern economics, but they do have a training in their gut on how to survive. So who would like to take an opportunity to define corruption? Just pass the microphone around and let's get a couple of definitions of corruption. Uh, corruption means abuse of power. Yes. Abuse of power typically in what way? Economically. Yes. More specifically, usually uh, for the for benefit of? The government or a higher power. Like well, the, the, yeah, the corruption government. should be for the benefit of you, for goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yes, but, but you've hit something very essential. You go through the many definitions of corruption and there are too many words, too many assumptions. Corruption is the abuse of power you've been given for your own benefit. That's typically 90% of it. And it doesn't have to be public corruption. It can be private corruption. Can you give me an example what you might think might be a corrupt transaction in private government? A pri I'm sorry, in private enterprise? An example I can think of is maybe when um, CEO of a CEO of a business like changes the numbers or <clears throat> does some kind of fraud to have more money. Exactly. Let's get a couple of others. That's a very good one. What about someone who's not at the CEO level? How could they abuse their position and? Construct a, corrupt, construct a corrupt transaction. Could it be so, someone stealing from their subordinates, maybe? Yes, it, it would be a type of theft, but give me an example of what a, tra a, 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 a excuse me, a corrupt transaction would look like. They're stealing from their business. What would that corrupt transaction look like? Blackmail. I love blackmail. <laughs> Uh, maybe a big company, like a small company, pays someone that decides who they will choose on different smaller companies to make a deal. Yeah. One of the worst attempts at bribery I have ever seen was a client of mine. He is, uh, have you ever seen those little pine tree incense on the uh, windshield, wi uh, windshield wiper, rear view mirror? That's him. He invented those. <laughs> and he went to China to buy paper. And the gentleman who was his paper broker kept asking him if he liked girls. He said, yes, but I have one. Do you like to uh, go out and party? No, I don't. <clears throat> Do you like Cartier watches? He said, no, I don't. Well, I'll take care of you. And he called me up. He says, what is, what's going on? I said, oh, you're going to get a bribe. He goes, it's my own company. I'm not going to steal from myself. I don't have enough personalities. <laughs> sure enough, what ends up on his bed? is a his and hers Cartier watch, about $30,000 worth of watch. He took a picture of them. They really were pretty. <laughs> he said, keep them, bring them to me. He said, really, Burke, what do I do? I said, just give them back. And you have a paper broker that's obviously putting in a lot more into the cost of the paper you're going to buy than it's actually worth. I suggest that you work with the American Chamber or others to find the paper supplier. And actually, we went through shipping records, went backwards, and found out who made the paper. He purchased the paper for 30% less than he had previously. So here you have an attempt at bribing a purchaser. But unfortunately, the gentleman trying to do the bribing didn't understand he was the owner and wasn't going to cheat himself. That position within a company to select providers of goods and services is incredibly power, powerful. How would you limit that power? There's always a benefit not cheating the company, but there's also a wonderful Russian proverb, and it's all a switch in your mind. If they pretend to pay me, I'll pretend to work for them. <laughs> so how do you get around that personal interest? What I was thinking is making the, 
in their interest not to do it, which is what you're asking, how to, and no. What, what I was thinking is making them part of the company. So there's a benefit in the keeping the cost low. Uh, maybe bonifications for saving money on the, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the year. So there will be something in it for them as long as they're keeping the costs low. I would, let's try another. You're, you, you've got half of it. You're holding the microphone, you're stuck. Yes, <laughs> I would first uh, make a new set of rules for the company and for the uh, relationship between the buyer, buyers and the company and then make a separate body uh, that uh, fiscalize this, this uh, relationship. You'd have a group of people looking at the relationship. Yes. Perfect. That's the other part of it. it Typically, the rule in my head, this is an unscientific, undocumented rule, but it's mine, that you have about three people that handle the, the process of purchasing. Why three people? Well, two people can form a cabal, and that can usually be pretty tight, but it gets even harder with three or more. So you, instead of concentrating the power, you diffuse the power in that company. Let's flip it around. <clears throat> Let's flip it around. You're going to a place to transact business. What is a sign that that environment might have some whiff of corruption? It's a concentration of power. And each person in that concentration of power has a yes or a no vote. It's like being blackballed. You can require 126 permits, which is what it's required to do to drill for oil in Russia, and one person can say no, you're done. You can't do that. What is an example out of economic literature of the problem of too many people having control? It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Anyone here of Hernando de Soto? The Other Path? Why Capitalism Succeeds in the West and Fails Elsewhere? Well, you have now, read both of the books. Hernando de Soto is an attorney in Peru, and he got his class to get a tailor's license for a person without paying a bribe. If you look at the amount of time it took, it took, I think, six or nine people, the better part of four months, working more or less full time to get those licenses. It was almost the equivalent of 1.5 man years, working man years to get the permits without bribes. Even after they got the shop set up, the inspectors would come by and want their little, uh, a little piece of action. You know, soles, soles. <laughs> but <clears throat> he also realized that the bribery in that, in that industry was taking around 15% of the gross, gross of the business. In fact, the corrupt officials were the number one profit makers. Nice, huh? So you often see what I'll call legislation for facilitation. Passing too many laws that are too complex. So the only result is for the economic being within us all is to pass a few dollars. We define bribe, we define corruption, and now we talked about the poor Chinese paper broker. How do you feel out someone to figure out if they're going to take a bribe and how much should you should offer? You don't want to overpay, for goodness sakes. How, what is that mechanism for figuring out where someone can take a bribe or that you should offer a bribe? Or on the other side, you should take a bribe and figure out what they're going to offer. How does that begin? In the mechanism of offering and taking a bribe, what would you need to see on either side to, to discern that that person may be interested in it? That in fact, this bribe could help your business or could help you helping a business? A uh, necessity. Like the one you said, uh, my son needs a surgery and my medical insurance doesn't cover it. So yeah. I need that money. Or I need to go to Monte Carlo, can you help me? Yeah. Needs is very good assessment. And sometimes that needs is discovered or a period of time of socialization 
and gift giving, ever more expensive gifts, part of the socialization. Having done business in China, that is how they do their due diligence. You realize that prior, oh gosh, prior to, I think it was 82, the telephone book was a classified document. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you know your counterparty is worthwhile? You engage in small transactions to test the waters. This is very human. That's how we begin. How does it end up in grand corruption, where you're fixing elections and contracts and the rest? Well, um, oh, good. I study psychology, so we study yes. that type of phenomenon as like rolling snow, bola yeah. de nieve. No sé cómo se dice en inglés. <laughs> Snowball, sí, gracias. So it's like a snowball. It starts very little and it starts to roll and goes it's really of, big. It's part of the fraud triangle. Opportunity, pressure, rationalization. We just talked about pressure and you're talking about the rationalization. It's excellent. And as a business owner, a person in government, really the only thing we control is opportunity. It's the only thing we control. So what we're seeing is that, oh, another point on the psychology is the fact that part of our justification often is a tribal choice. Well, they're not part of my family. That's in the Middle East. That's not part of my family or my tribe, so it's okay. You can't do that to one of my tribe members, but you can do it to another tribe member. We break up into tribes more so than we even imagine. And I was listening to this presentation on tribes, and you know, I, I gave the professor a little pushback. He gave me a slap back. He said, do you belong to clubs or organizations? Yes. He goes, okay, those are tribes. Do you have a sports team? No, I, I'm not a fan of sports. I'd rather go hiking and do something like that. He goes, that's your own tribe. You're the out tribe on sports. By golly, he picked off four or five tribes I belonged to and I didn't even have a membership card. We self-sort. We self-sort into those communities where we feel welcomed, we feel accepted. We become part of that community. And that tribalism also occurs in commerce and it occurs in business, like a political party <laughs> or a business ethos. So again, we come back as a student of psychology, that so much of the choice to become corrupt is here. The, the idea that with a small act, I can do a little better, I can get ahead, I can make a difference for my family, my tribe. We talked about <clears throat> some of the items that would make an economic environment ripe for corruption. We talked about lots of laws. We talked about an inefficient economic system. What are some other things that would contribute to an environment ripe to make that corrupt choice? I didn't see what happened, so it didn't happen. <laughs> What would contribute to an environment that would encourage corruption, to encourage an individual to make that choice to betray the power they have given for the company, the government, a person, for themselves? Um, Can you repeat that question? Absolutely. <laughs> In an economic environment, it could be macro, it could be micro. What would some of the other elements be to encourage someone to make that corrupt choice, to betray their government, betray their employer, to betray the person who gave them the power in the first place? Maybe it could be personal interest. Maybe that other person that he trusts already can't uh, give him what he needs, so he goes to another a resource that can actually give him what he wants. That's part of it. That's absolutely part of it. How about some more? Um, hi. 
uh, one of the parts about it is that it develops kind of like um, people thinking of it as the ends instead of focusing on the means. Um, and by focusing on the ends, they want to achieve a certain end. And to achieve that end, they will do anything for it instead of focusing on means uh, like in state work or public functionaries. Um, when they focus on the ends, they don't focus on the work that they're doing currently, and instead they will do um, bad things or non-transparent acts to try to get to that end. So I think that it's a focus thing, if that makes sense. Excellent. And what you're talking about is ideology. Their ideology trumps authenticity. Their ideology is more important than the rules they agree to abide by. What are some of the examples of systemic corruption? Um, I'll give one I saw from Kenya. In Kenya, <clears throat> they built a highway between Mombasa on the coast and um, <clears throat> the capital city of Nairobi. The old road wasn't great. The new road was wonderful for six months and then fell apart. The problem is there was so much money changing hands that the government would never hold the contractor to repair the substandard road. The contractor has essentially insurance from putting in a crappy road because they've given the government officials bribery money to get the contract in the first place. Ouch. What other examples can you think of? And it doesn't matter where they are or what they are. We talked about corruption in Kenya and how the contractor bribed the government so even if he put in a crappy road, there's nothing that was gonna be done about it. What other examples do you see as a consequence, from the consequences of corruption? Well, um, some organizations don't function as well as they should have. Um, let's say police here in Guatemala, you don't have like the certainty that there, you're going to be safe and yeah. they want to just make money off, out of you. Yeah, essentially the police begin selling protection service that they should have already been providing. That's exactly, exactly right. This young lady here. Um, I think our country is a perfect example of how corruption affects and the effects it has. Like for example, our educational system, like the one from public places, um, it's it's one of the worst in the world. So we are talking about how people are taking money for the kids and they are affecting our future. Yes, education is ripe with corruption and it may not just be here. I know it is in the United States. Of every dollar in the United States, what percent of that dollar I'm sorry, every dollar in the United States for education, kindergarten through senior in high school, 12th, 12th grade, what percent is spent in the classroom? Any guess? 17. <laughs> 17, it's not that bad, but it's close. Yeah, it's around 35 to 45% of every dollar is spent in the classroom. The less, rest is spent on administration and compliance. When you look at a school administrator making $350,000 a year and the starting salary of a teacher is $35,000 a year, I think we've got a problem. I've come up with a, another theory on corruption. <clears throat> and again, it's my theory. It's not scientifically tested, nor has a paper been authored on it. But do we all remember that bell curve of life? when people are grading on the curve, where the entire world exists between minus four and plus four standard deviations. How am I doing? Do you have the bell curve in your mind? Yes. I want to hear that again. Do you have the bell curve in your mind? Yes. Uh, you got to get your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> to the left side of the bell curve, I envision that those are the people with the most amount of empathy. These are the people who rescue the dogs and the turtles and the doves and work in the religious orders. They have the greatest deal of empathy. And going to the far right hand side, those we go from an empathetic 
to a psychopathic. And that in the far right hand side you have the, 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 the psychopaths. Now, we're not out at the 99th percentile psychopath that is a, a, a serial killer. But let's draw it back in to about the 80th percentile. Do we see people in this area? And the answer is we absolutely do. We see these people that are often the CEOs of, of companies. The absolutely difficult entrepreneurs. People like maybe Steve Jobs. These are people notoriously difficult to deal with. And I'll add another group into there is the great explorers. I had a really rotten time in my life from uh, 86 to 92. I was, <laughs> I was being sued and I was suing other people. I learned more about the law the hard way. It was expensive. A law degree would have been cheaper. But I was reading about the great explorers. And what you find is that the great explorers not only did great things, they were almost universally reviled. They were terrible, nasty, difficult, and ugly people. One particular explorer by the name of Wilkes discovered more of Antarctica than any explorer to, that to, to date. It was the United States USX expedition. And when he came back, his crew mutinied complained about his behavior, his viciousness, and his comment was, these were very difficult places and times. I could not give one quarter or accept one quarter. And he lost his command. Meanwhile, his collection from the Antarctica and Southern Latin America formed the beginning of the Smithsonian Museum. So somewhere out there, there's a personality type that is interested in corruption. Did you read the coin toss study before he came? Yeah, not a single hand up. Everyone's looking away from the microphone. Well, oh, don't get to me. <laughs> I hope the microphone will follow me a bit here. The coin toss study was a brilliant study. <clears throat> the one that's in your uh, readings is a little different, but it's essentially the same thing. It was a study of people coming out of college in India and they were asked do they want to select for a private enterprise track or a public enterprise track? Do they want to work for the government or private enterprise? And there was a hint in the coin toss that the more times a coin comes up heads, the more likely they are to be considered for a job in either private or public sector. The, the difference was night and day. Most of the tosses in private enterprise followed statistical averages of tossing a coin 10 times. It followed the statistical averages. Some heads, some tails, some heads, some tails. In those that wanted to seek job in the public sector, in government, Approximately 50% of the tosses were all heads. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> what you're seeing is people who are selecting, who themselves are selecting for an enterprise where they think that corruption can benefit them. The same experiment was repeated in the Netherlands. It was just the opposite. The more authentic people wanted to be in public service, the more people wanted to get ahead and put money in their pocket went to the private sector. That might be an interesting experiment for Guatemala. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> we have two scenarios. <clears throat> I will read them for you. Wait, could I ask you a question? Um, Absolutely. Do you think that these uh, differences between cultures, or like India and uh, what did you say the other ones, Netherlands, um, is it due to like societal differences between the two countries? Like um, in uh, India, for example, it is more likely and more prone for people to be corrupt in public settings versus Netherlands where, um, it, like why do you think that is, is my question? Because I understand the point, but I'm not quite sure what leads to like the difference? The, the question is, is it a societal difference between India and, and Copenhagen in, in the Netherlands? Um, I don't know. I wish I could plug my brain in, but there certainly is an expectation difference. 
that those people who self-select to be a little corrupt are self-selecting that vein of work where they think they will make more. And that the people in the Netherlands thought it was private enterprise, the people in India thought it was public service. Um, and, and I think that's, a, a, if not so much societal, but economic expectations of the graduates. Um, I could be wrong too. <laughs> All right, here we go. Corporate gifting policy. Are you ready? Good. As an independent consultant, you have been asked to work with a large multinational company. The company is involved in the purchase, restoration, and upgrade of older Hind helicopters. They're originally built in Ukraine. The aircraft are multi-use, but are easily armed. They are a favorite of helicopter of smaller countries with border issues and insurgent issues, and they're cheap and easy to fly. You have been, you've accepted the generous retainer and have begun work to help the company. Ah, you've been with the company for a week. A scandal has rocked the company. One of the former executives was both getting and giving gifts that were in fact quite large. The amount is a bit of a mystery as these gifts always have a difference between retail and perceived purchase value, but I'll assure you they were quite large. The executive is protesting the broad brush of mischief uh, he is being painted with, as he said that this gifts expensive meetings is the normal course of doing business with the intended clients. The nature of building trust between the company and the client for sale involves some time being spent on expensive social obligations, and some, rem rem excuse me, and some remembrance or thank you gifts. I can't sell tens of millions of dollars of equipment by taking this type of client to a cheap restaurant. I cannot sell what I have sold dropping off greeting cards with a nice piece of candy inside. The governments and company positions are ludicrous. I will fight these acquisitions and any charges leveled, no plea deal. Senior management got out in front of you and sent out a press release. Senior management said, uh, we're going to pursue, pursue ultimate integrity. We're gonna have a zero tolerance policy for any bribery or gift giving outside of policy guidelines, and that each and every transaction will be fully invented to ensure no undue influence will ever occur. Guess what? Your new assignment is to write the corporate gifting policy. <laughs> so what, what, what do you see here? What do you see in this scenario? What catches your eye, your ear, your mind? What do you think? All right, how's this? How come anyone knows about this? Wasn't, weren't these private? These are private. How come someone knows about it? Why would someone know about it? Please help me, why would someone know about it? Uh, corruption. He can know about it because someone inside the company told him and that's not supposed to happen. And that's, uh, to me that's an example of corruption and I don't know if I'm wrong. I think you're right. There's one other place it could have come from. Come on, you're thinking too hard. Stop thinking hard, think easy. There's two parties to a transaction, the company and the... Uh, the person who's receiving it. Yes, AKA customer. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Which one would have leaked it? Don't know. Don't know, but you're on, you've got it. What else do you think's going on? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> <laughs> other than, other than the the customer or someone inside the company, who would have told the story on the former executive? I don't know, maybe the person that he, it's making the transaction, like contract another business or something like that, that started the other company. Correct, competition, yeah. The competitor leaks it to hopefully throw these people out of the game on the bidding of the contract. Ooh, there could be many reasons. 
Now we talk about the gifting policy. The question really is about the corporate gifting policy, and I'll give you what I have come from my students and customers to find is probably the best. And the gifting policy is simple. Gifts can be exchanged, but every single gift given or received must be logged in by the company. Why? What happens if I give you a gift um, limit of $100? I give you a copy of my book, we have lunch, we have a glass of wine, we tell stories about the one, oh sorry. <laughs> we have a good time, and then I ask you, you know, you need to give me my bank loan. And you said, oh, you can apply. I said, yeah, but you received over $220 in gifts from me. Give me the bank loan or I'll tell the bank. I've got you. Sometimes our efforts to eliminate corruption cause the opportunity for the criminals to entrap us. So keep thinking. <clears throat> Last scenario is pretty simple. It's Brazil. You're going to have a sporting event. Your name is going to be on people around flying with squirrel suits, aircraft, watercraft. The cup is in your name and you need 42 permits to handle all of these things in one central permit. Is only 200 euros, but the gentleman demands 50,000 euros. What do you do? If you don't pay him and it doesn't go forward, you're on the hook for another 7 million euros. Go or no go? Any ideas on how you'd handle that? Again, the baseball bat, but. How would you handle that? How do you, as an honest company, Make a, an iffy payment. The solution was fairly elegant. They hired a law firm to pay him the 200 euros and to pay him the additional money, and then they reported it as income to the Brazilian tax authorities. <laughs> so much for cash under the table. And he also reported it to all the organizers and what he had to do. They paid it above the board. Yeah. yeah. The thing about corruption is it's part of us, and we have to be aware when the opportunity presents itself corruption um, and when we could get caught by a corruption. Often, once you're in a corrupt relationship, you can't get out. You're in. It's like a fraternity with no exit. I hope we had a good discussion here, and now. It's any question, even though you've all touched the microphone at least twice, at <laughs> least twice, any questions, please. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, we talked about, you talked about corruption in the private sector, but what, what are the options for a citizen, a normal citizen, in a country where there's systemic corruption, <clears throat> not just uh, one-time corruption, but systemic corruption? That's probably another two hours. <laughs> the, ans the answer is try to avoid it where you can. Um, there was a, a program that was in India called the Zero Rupee program. And that was where when someone asked you for uh, a payment, you gave them a Zero Rupee note with a three-pillar organization that was fighting anti-corruption on the back. And sometimes that worked very well, and the people who received the three-pillar note were very afraid. Other times, they crumpled it up and said, we don't care. <laughs> There's a lot more to it, and it really goes to, and you'll have a speech in the document that I gave in Nigeria, really goes to looking at corruption as a garden. And that if you tend your garden properly, the fruits grow. If you don't tend your garden, the weeds come up. And it's about slowly eliminating the weeds without killing everything else in the garden. It's the best metaphor I could come up with. <laughs>